Namaste, Namaskar, Vanakam. And uh, again, uh, it's the same type of uh, beginning. I'm delighted to be with you all because the type of comments I receive is extremely good. I find them very, very useful, except of course, one or two or a couple of them which are abusing. Other than that, and I thank uh, Sri Iyer for the opportunity. Today we will have a look at why India is an eyesore for the uh, global powers, particularly the declining powers. Why they would like to create a problem for India and other things. This is very, very important. We thought we will focus on it. If you find uh, recently there have been uh, cases of attack on Indians in various uh, places from Australia to USA and uh, uh, UK and other thing and there is also a systematic movement in UK and uh, part of USA to malign Indians more so the Hindus as uh, some people who are very very aggressive and uh, fascist and all these things. If you look back at history from the 50s after the independence onwards significant number of uh, riots, agitation and uh, you know the various type of violent movement within the country I can tell with uh, full amount of uh, vigor and rigor were all supported, instigated and financed from abroad. None of them were you can classify them as domestic movement. For instance the movement for the uh, Naxal that was one of the largest uh, violent movement in the late 60s, you know, we had the uh, Chaur Majamdar, Kanu Zanyal and uh, the, the Chinese uh, media talked about it as a spring thunder over India and other things. And it also had some amount of spread in Bihar, more so in Srikakulam area of Andhra Pradesh, etc. That is the one of the major movement we can think uh, in terms of uh, creating uh, violence and chaos against the state. They wanted to overthrow the state and they wanted the you know the villages to uh, sort of uh, encircle cities and all that old Maoist uh, uh, doctrine and other thing. Other than that uh, major next major thing was in south uh, along around that time 65-66 anti-Hindi agitation that is also supported, funded and uh, instigated from abroad. Primarily the British and uh, partly the Americans. Actually TN Session was to, in his book, uh, written detail about uh, CIA involvement. But uh, very interestingly or very uh, tragically, uh, he was staying in uh, Chennai uh, in one of his visits at uh, uh, Taj Koramandal at uh, Kodamakam area. The hotel was attacked and uh, glass panes were smashed and other things. That's a level of freedom of expression in Tamil Nadu. You can say anything against ADMK or ADMK or any of those uh, groups. The answer is uh, you will get attacked. You will get uh, now of course the government is uh, in their hand, ADMK's hand. They will arrest you and put you in check gate. So the anti in the agitation is the second. Third is the Kalistani movement, which also was uh, uh, spreading its uh, tentacles. And uh, but for the uh, see, you know, severe type of action later on taken by Gill and other thing. Anyhow, that uh, came to a uh, sort of a temporary pause, I would say, because it's not completely extinguished. And that was also supported, funded and financed from global forces. One of the major supporters was uh, from Canada and various other countries. And LTT in the south everybody knows was uh, significantly funded from uh, their uh, compulsory funding actually it was. They took uh, the subscription in terms of 5%, 8%, 3% of the pay of the uh, Sri Lankan Tamils all over Europe and other places. So this is how almost all the agitation and local agitation like for instance uh, against Kudangulam plant, it's now very well established. It was financed from abroad. 
then uh, there is a uh, agitation against sterilite which was also funded and supported from abroad so all these uh, movements are supported and funded from abroad domestically actually there is uh, nothing even the recent as uh, a so called farmers movement as it is called by all the you know fat cats of punjab who are neither farmers nor having any uh, but who are you know what you may loosely call the middlemen who are making huge amount of money who are not very enthusiastic they blocked delhi and we all know about it then the ca anti uh, registration agitation and other why the domestic uh, very very uh, rare you come across people getting mobilized and uh, doing on a large scale because by and large our people are very very patient very very calm and they wait a longer period of time and uh, good or bad they believe in the law of karma and then all these things are there but why the external external forces are let us be very very clear about it are extremely unhappy with india for the simple reason we are an extraordinarily heterogeneous country and 75 years we have carried on some 20 plus languages some 100 plus cuisines plus uh, 100 types of uh, dress habits and uh, so many type of eight seven eight major religions you name anything it it actually you know it puzzles the west not only puzzles it creates a sense of awe and uh, many a time a uh, sense of uh, what you may loosely call envy and uh, everybody knows for instance uh, the us government from the 50s they never liked any democratic country you name one country democratic which was uh, fondly embraced by us now us always liked dictatorship particularly the military dictatorship variety recently i think our foreign minister has brought it out very nicely the reason is it's very easy to control it's a highly homogenized type of system once you bribe the dictator and his coterie after that uh, you can get anything done the democratic country is messy you know all sorts of uh, divisions and uh, uh, discussion and other thing it's not going to be a easy thing and parliament and uh, various other things. so the us has always been not very enthusiastic about uh, democratic countries it was very much uh, in love with only dictatorship dictatorships of homogeneous countries as i told homogeneous systems are the ones which are uh, fascinating for the west homogeneous system in the sense uh, uh, the rop and rol are homogeneous in the sense uh, one book one leader one uh, type of a uh, thinking in spite of the fact that rol has got huge number of uh, sub uh, grouping in the form of protestant in the form of catholics in the form of uh, episcopalians and the church of england and you know, nowadays pentecostal and various other evangelical movement but still all of them come and claim themselves to be under a single umbrella of a one god one book type of pakti anyhow but uh, we are a extremely heterogeneous country culture not today for the last 2000 year which has always been a you know what intriguing thing or a, as i told you envious thing also one of the reason why we have been uh, uh, substantially heterogeneous is huge amount of uh, internal migration have always been taking place and as a tradition as a culture we never had any question of rejecting anybody or not accepting anybody or anything it's a question of acceptance not tolerance kindly know the different uh, so that's another reason why when the uh, the islamist came into india or the uh, english came into india the local civilization could not uh, understand that there can be cultures which uh, do do not accept others acceptance and internal migration was massive we are uh, now so much is being discussed about the for instance uh, the saraswat brahmins links with the kashmir somewhere in the dakshin kannada deep south 
and uh, that is the type and uh, from uh, south uh, even today the you know the priest in uh, the nepal pasipatinath temple goes from the south and uh, huge number of people from kanyagob kanyagob brahmins are moved all over the country assam to orissa to various other places mostly in order to serve in the temples or mostly by the uh, what one can call request of the local kings and we have uh, actually not many people may even be aware of it there was small uh, ayengar community in purulia in west bengal bera ayengar there i think if i remember correctly where purulia in west bengal they have moved there and settled and uh, they are known as uh, purulia ayengars bera ayengar good number of them have uh, achieved uh, various uh, positions in civil service and various uh, the point is they moved uh, of course uh, different records are there about uh, you know the jayadeva time 7th century and also at the time of nathamuni anyhow there are so many type of uh, historical uh, discussion about uh, how did they move there and how did they have more amount of uh, inflows also and similarly for instance during the uh, shivaji time is uh, brothers and various other later the, uh, the marathis uh, moved into some portions of south so also from saurashtra they were known as actually the <laughs> marathi brahmins or saurashtra uh, groups in uh, areas like kumbakonam madurai and uh, so many other places so they have always been there so there is nothing uh, what you may loosely call uh, new to the thing some of them seems to have come as uh, for as the tailors for the army of uh, the shivaji and his uh, later uh, successors some of them uh, actually there is a uh, evidence to suggest that the sambar was actually the one of the original dishes uh, prepared by them anyhow so the acceptance is a critical thing not tolerance there is a lot of difference between the two acceptance is a critical thing and because of this uh, mass migrations across the country over a long period of time we are extraordinarily heterogeneous there is no doubt about it and any attempt to homogenize that is not going to succeed and we want to homogenize it uh, and there will be resistance for instance uh, uh, in the name of uh, right to education we classify one group as uh, you know to follow certain principles and other which need not be followed by people of islam and uh, christianity and there will be you know definitely ruled you know like lingayat wanted to have their own uh, separate thing they would like to be called as actually a separate religion today for instance uh, in tamil nadu there is a you uh, and cry about this chidambaram group chidambaram temple chidambaram temple has been handed over by cholas to the dikshadars who have been managing it and they have their own methods of doing things and uh, no point in trying to impose uh, the external secular uh, rules on them this is just uh, you know sp- you know to spite them to just to you know this is uh, how the the current government deals with uh, issues of hindus and temples and other thing sooner or later they would also like to be called uh, not as hindus if you recall actually uh, ramkrishna mahat uh, once upon a time wanted to be called uh, not hindus and that's because of the jyoti babu government's uh, uh, no, harassment of them under the banner of hindu so the hindu banner itself is a broad umbrella under which so many groupings and so many type of uh, people have been accommodated it's extremely heterogeneous and this has always been a puzzle to the global uh, countries these fellows are so heterogeneous so many fault lines which are well known it's not our fault lines or not something which is uh, hidden or anything actually our country is uh, one of the uh, you know 100% open type of a country you can just get in walk around anywhere go anywhere photograph all the snake charmers and uh, you know the in the olden days actually that used to be uh, poverty tourism you may loosely call come here and then uh, you have to you can get some awards and other thing 
the joke used to be the global photographers used to be told the eighth beggar on the line in tirupati the seventh beggar on the ajmer dargah these are the fellows whom you should focus and that would give you a lot of credit and other thing so this is what uh, used to have been we have been having huge amount of fault lines which have been enormously exploited by others actually but still we are continuing and now of late last uh, uh, 10 15 years we are thriving we are one of the highest growing uh, country in the whole world in the in spite of all this corona in spite of all this uh, problems and other thing so others can't understand what is happening and they feel it's a major threat because homogenization is the process which is uh, totally in conformity with the development of those countries even global corporations would like to have homogenization for instance they would love everybody to wear levy jeans everybody to drink coke everybody to have the same uh, omelet everybody to have the same uh, you know burger and you know the heterogeneity is something which is not appreciated by the global company global companies love actually homogeneity homogeneity and these uh, rol and rop also love actually homogeneity everybody knows about it and many of the governments also prefer homogeneity because they think that's the best way to run the system but uh, our heterogeneity is something which is uh, fascinating actually it's thriving and uh, in the earlier period it was just you know so, you know what we may loosely call it was just uh, sustaining itself but of late we find that uh, this is uh, Uh, doing very well and uh, this is something which uh, is an eyesore and this is not going to be allowed to thrive because uh, then it will show to the whole world whether it is iran whether it is uh, uh, uk whether it is germany or anything that uh, you can be heterogeneous and you can live with each other that whole idea is uh, anathema to uh, many of the kingdoms in the middle east which will not be agreeing to that as well as uh, many of the uh, g7 countries which find it very uh, what one can call awkward they will tolerate they don't mind you know they can have uh, other religions other language speak but uh, tolerance is different than acceptance and this multiculture has failed uh, in germany in uk they openly say that uh, they cannot sustain this uh, multiculturalism so oh, this is a thing which is as i told you this is a very very major challenge for them to look at this uh, heterogeneous uh, system heterogeneous systems have always been thriving among the old uh, conflict is a man's conflict with nature man's conflict with man and man's conflict within himself the religion of love christianity focused uh, more on man's conflict with the nature particularly post protestant time the science began to dominate and then uh, that was not liked by the church actually when they told the world is round and uh, global and uh, it's not uh, and the, as everybody knows about uh, the suffering undergone by some of those scientists in those days the islam was not so enthusiastic about this uh, it was more about uh, man's conflict with man it was wanting to conquer places and other thing much later it uh, because of that the, the crusades and other thing also came into existence but our culture and system if you go back it was always man's conflict with himself it was uh, trying to look inside and what is the nature of uh, our uh, jivatma how does it linked with paramatma this is a sort of a a uh, person which has been raised uh, as early as second century third century you know you can go back and then so the heterogeneity comes out of that uh, idea of uh, trying to uh, look inside as long as it doesn't damage others they don't uh, the acceptance was always there as long as you don't say that you will cut off the head of the other man they would not mind actually the debate and discussion is the fundamental basis of heterogeneous culture uh, you recall the argument adi shankara had 
with Mandan Mishra. That is the basic culture, not the culture of belt bomb or anything. So, what is uh, expected is, you can expect many more attacks on Indians all over the world. One is they are doing well and any group which is doing well is an eyesore for the uh, current world where there is unemployment, where there is a, a person of a significant amount of recession and so many other issues and other things. Individually and collectively they are doing very well. Actually there are some statistics that say that the highest earning you know, minority group in USA is now actually the uh, American Indians, not even Jews. And so 30% of the property is acquired in London by people of Indian origin and all this uh, you know, uh, increases the uh, level of envy. And so domestically they would try to create as much mischief as possible, whether India can be destabilized. India, can it be used to fight who they consider as their enemies? They would like India also to consider them as their enemies, like Russia or China or anything. If India can't be used in that direction, whether India can be uh, destabilized in order to make India go in that direction. It's very, very simple. Declining powers are very dangerous, as I always used to maintain. And G7 is a declining power. How are we going to face it is very, very uh, important. And uh, I don't think this uh, destabilization from them should affect us. We should focus on our activity and we should too much worry about uh, you know the what one can call the recognition from the so-called whites. Recently there was an hunger index. Suddenly we were put at something 200 or 174 or whatever it is. Lot of countries which are getting aid from us is put ahead of us. All these are bogus type of thing deliberately uh, constructed and uh, to put India at uh, and there are enough local media to pick up some of these things and uh, uh, you know make a big issue about it the whole uh, uh, you know what you may loosely call the procedure adopted is inadequate and uh, totally you know the german uh, uh, basis of uh, height and weight is not applicable to india and they say 1800 calorie and how many people eat it there is no need for 1800 calorie also it's a question of you know anyhow what I want to stress is, there would be a la lot more reports like that ridiculing India. There will be a lot more attempts to uh, instigate internal issues uh, like, you know, against India, against this, against that and other thing will start. It's not going to be. So the next decade is going to be a massively challenging decade because uh, we are now in fourth or fifth position globally. In terms of global GDP, we will be slowly moving into second or th third or fourth position. That is going to be. So, US, China and India are going to be the three major powers to watch. And that would be a situation where we would be like, you know, the stupid questions, which side you are taking will always be asked. Because for the West, homogenized West, it's either zero or one. But for India, it is not zero or one. It's a, so many colors in between. So many grays are available in between. We are much more like a Schrodinger's cat type of a situation. We are not in terms of 100% certainty on zero or one. We have always operated like that throughout our 2000 years of history. And we should continue to do so. And our heterogeneity is our strength. Let's not try to convert ourselves into a homogeneous system and other thing. That's one of the reasons I am not very comfortable with the so-called uh, UCC, what is called uh, Common Civil Code and um, we will take it up in some other context and some other situation. And uh, hail heterogeneity and uh, hail our uh, resilience, hail our strength rather than it is our weakness. Thank you very much. Thank you.